Welcome everyone to our technical webinar today. We're really excited to cover the content we have uh, for you today. It's going to be a long webinar, but hopefully a very effective one. We'll have a few breaks here and there. And, uh, you know, the big thing is that we want to have audience participation. Before we jump into the actual content, and I turn the time over to Kevin Woodworth, I want to do a little bit of housekeeping. First question that we always get is, are you recording this session? And the answer is absolutely. You'll find this webinar recording, as well as all the other webinar recordings, the technical workshops we've done, the sales and marketing webinars we've done, et cetera, in our webinar recordings playlist on YouTube. If you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, I definitely recommend getting in there. That way you get informed not only of these webinar recordings, but also the great new marketing videos and other content we create. So you can simply go to youtube.com, search for Qualsys, Q-O-L-S-Y-S, and find us and subscribe to that channel. We'll also put a link to that channel uh, in the chat today so that you can participate in that and, and uh, get those where you can. Uh, as you're formatting the presentation and the cameras today, know that the GoToWebinar tool in most cases, depending on what platform you're using or, or what device you're using, should have a way to take a little divider and you can move it around so you can either make the cameras bigger or the presentation bigger, however you like. Uh, format it the way you like. I like to have it so that the presentation and the cameras are about equal, makes it easy to see the person because oftentimes Kevin will be pulling actual hardware up and demonstrating things. So it's nice to have that camera nice and visible, but you choose how it's best for you uh, to, to fit your particular needs. We also want a lot of audience participation today, and we will do that through the chat. If you can find the chat or question section of your GoToWebinar control panel, go ahead and send us a message right now. Type in where you're calling from. Are you working from home? Are you taking a break from a job to listen in? Um, you know, we just love to see it. And it looks like we've already got lots and lots of people on. We have, this is a very well-registered webinar. Uh, Jim, welcome from sunny Florida. Alex in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Richard in Clovis, California. Thomas in Minneapolis. Frank, good to see you, buddy. Glad you're here. Mark, Ray, Kathy, Nick, Stanley Norman, always one of our favorites. Glad you're here, buddy. Mike in Pittsburgh. David in Glasgow, Kentucky. That's an important distinction there. Uh, <laughs> uh, Midland, Ontario. Looks like Kevin's joining us. And Brian and Peter and David and Jelsey and Corey. The list goes on and on. So many awesome people joining us from all over the place. And it, literally, I, I, I wish I could get to every single one of you. Jordan and Taylor and Patrick and Freddie and Trevor and so many familiar names too. So everyone, again, thank you so much for joining us. Also, if you haven't already, it's a great idea to join our Facebook groups. And any of you already on there, I recognize your names and your faces from there. Um, but join our Facebook groups. If you go onto Facebook and look up Qualsys and Alarm.com installers, and we'll, again, we'll put the names of these groups in the chat for you. Qualsys and Alarm.com installers, that one's run by one of our distribution partners. Burglar Alarms Online, uh, run by another one of our distribution partners. And then we have three official ones. Uh, we would encourage you to join the official Qualsys technicians and installers group. There's also a sales and marketing group and a distributor group if you happen to be a, a sales and marketing person or want to keep tabs on what sales and marketing is doing. Uh, or if you happen to be one of our distributors, you can join that group as well. But you should at least, if you're in this webinar, chances are the technicians and installers group, the official one, will be the right one for you. And those Facebook groups are great because you'll have a chance to ask questions, make comments, post pictures of challenges you have, and get help and support from the audience. And it's a really great way to have the community help you be better at the installs you're doing. Kevin, before we jump right in, I wanted to say thank you for taking the time to prepare this webinar. I know how much work you've put into this. Uh, there's been, this has been a really long time putting all this together. We've got one today. We've also are doing another one exactly like this two weeks from today. And if I'm not mistaken, you've also built it, built this same content into a learning management system on the Qualsys dealer portal. Is that right? Yep, that's right. That's now just this week posted on our dealer portal. We'll talk more about the dealer portal at the end of this training if you're not familiar. But yeah, that's up and running there as well. Okay, great. Well, everyone, strap in, get excited, type in your questions and comments as you get them. You might not get them all addressed right here, but we do have an awesome group of individuals that I want to recognize right now that is helping us to get all those done. We've got Joel on the line. We've got Mark on the line. Uh, we've got Neil Jones on the line. Many of you, you know, you know those names from our workshops, from other webinars we've done, things like that. They're all here and ready to type in answers to your questions and get you answers right away. And if it's relevant and, and pertinent for the whole group uh, at the appropriate times, they'll also bring that up to Kevin as well, and he can answer it live on the air. So, Kevin, we're going to turn the time over to you. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us today and enjoy this technical webinar.
Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. I'm very, very happy to be here today. Again, we're slated to do this for about two hours here. We'll see how it goes. We'll try to keep it engaging. We will definitely stop and ask for questions. But if you think of stuff along the way as I'm typing um, or as I'm talking, please type them in. And like you said, the, the crew will answer those. We may, if, if it's kind of pertinent to the broad audience, we may stop and take that on the air, so to speak. Um, before we got started with the actual agenda, Jeremy, I wanted to launch a couple polls. Maybe that's something you can do for me. We have three polls here loaded, and this really allows us to gauge the audience here, get some information before we start this presentation, and uh, that way we can kind of cater some of the content in real time here. Um, so Jeremy or maybe Neil, if you can launch those polls for me and kind of MC that, that would be great. Yeah, I just started them, Kev. Perfect. All right, so the first poll, do you currently install IQ Panel 2 Plus? Let me see if I can pull up this uh, this poll here live as, as it's going here. About 85% are currently installing an IQ2. Well, just over 80% voted. We'll leave that open for a few more seconds. There we go. Yeah, so about 86% currently installing IQ2. That's awesome. Perfect. Okay, we'll get the second one going. So have you installed an IQ panel for yet? Let's see here. About 20% uh, so far have installed IQ panel four, but uh, only about 60% of the 70% of the vote so far. So we'll keep it going for just a couple more seconds till we get around that 80, 85% mark, and then we'll close that one up as well. Yeah, pretty steady. So it's about 23% uh, have installed IQ4 so far. Okay, so let me just get the last one up. And here you go. So which of the following sensor technologies are you primarily using today? So you can, it's multiple choice, check all that apply. So PowerG, 319, 345, or 433. Nice, right, so about 55% Power G, 25% 20, S line, and a mix between the other two. All right, perfect. That, close it up. I'm back to you, Kev. Perfect. And you guys can still hear me okay, Neil, and see me? Yes, sir. Okay. Awesome. Well, with that, guys, we're going to go ahead and uh, jump right in here. Uh, appreciate you filling out those polls. Those really help us, like I said, cater the conversation. Um, sounds like uh, most of you have installed an IQ Panel 2 Plus. Many of you, about 20, 25%, have already done an IQ Panel 4, which I think is helpful. And then giving a breakdown of the sensor mix is also really interesting for us as we as we engage here. So again, today's training, about two hours. We'll try to keep it engaging. Uh, we're going to start with an overview section here, and uh, we'll spend a good amount of time on that. Then we'll kind of dive into the weeds a little bit on software and hardware and some additional programming, some best tips and tricks, kind of best practices style. Um, and uh, then we'll wrap it up with uh, testing and uh, support and our dealer site and things like that. So here we go. We'll jump right off with a quick video. Hopefully this plays OK over GoToWebinar here, but uh, we'll give it a shot. <laughs>
All right, so hopefully that gave you a good overview. Again, we're gonna spend a bunch of time talking about all the things you saw in that video and kind of diving in, into the details of each of those here. Um, so, but again, that was kind of meant to be an overview. Before we get started, I do have one slide on us. If you didn't know, Qualsys or the IQ panel line is now part of the Johnson Controls family, which of course also includes PowerG and DSC with the great Power Series Neo product. Uh, what you get from that is really the innovation from the uh, from the Qualsys side of the house that we're known for, along with the reliability um, of PowerG and DSC, and then kind of the scalability of Johnson Controls. And you know that's never really been more important than it is now in the world we live in uh, with all the supply chain issues around us and everything else going on, kind of having all this come together to provide a robust system for you and your customers, uh, we think is uh, really important. Uh, IQ Panel 4 is built on a long foundation of successful products uh, in, uh, before it. And this really, the best way to think about this is kind of an evolution, right, versus an all new product. Um, each of the stepping stones uh, before IQ Panel 4 uh, lead to, to what you see today in the product. And many of you were here uh, for that journey and, and traveled along with us and contributed along the way, whether it was hardware changes or through all the various software updates, feedback, things you asked for, uh, you really see that manifest itself in the product over time. And so we're super excited about the latest generation uh, product, which we call IQ Panel 4. Now, IQ Panel 4 is our new flagship platform. Uh, it's really designed to be the replacement for IQ Panel 2 Plus. So it kind of has everything you know and love and I, about IQ Panel 2 Plus, as well as a bunch of new features and a bunch of new hardware. Um, so we keep the seven inch HD touchscreen, but one of the big differences is we go to from a quad core processor to what we call an eight core SOM, and we'll spend a little bit more time on that here uh, in the training, what that means, but it's a much more powerful starting point. Um, one way to think about this is just in time. When you think about uh, products over time, IQ Panel 2 actually came out in late 2016. So that was about five years ago, almost exactly. And in late 2016 is when Apple released the iPhone 7. And you know, here we are on 13 now. So you can see it's a big generational gap between IQ Panel 2 and IQ Panel 4. And uh, again, we'll talk a little bit more about that. We maintain uh, what we call dual SRF, which is Power G with, with one legacy radio, be it 319, 345, or 433. That's been wildly successful on IQ Panel 2 Plus. Keep that same architecture going forward. Uh, we keep two-way voice over Volte. And in fact, we have three microphones here uh, for some of the best two-way voice you've ever heard. Uh, and then one, area where we concentrated specifically on IQ Panel 4 was what we call faster, better, stronger. And that's basically improving in every way the different wireless radios uh, that we have on board uh, to be faster and to have further range. Um, so we do that on PowerG. Again, we'll talk about that. Wi-Fi, cellular, Bluetooth gets improved, and uh, so does Z-Wave especially. Now we've always had Bluetooth on all of our products. We've been we've kind of invented Bluetooth disarming, and one of the things we did beyond Bluetooth disarming with IQ Panel 4 was Bluetooth music streaming. So we'll talk about that. We've got an all-new speaker system on here. We improved the panel camera uh, with something we call Flex Tilt. We'll talk about that, as well as the installation system. Uh, it's called Smart Mount. We'll talk about that. And then lastly, we had a lot of people asking for different colors of the panel whether it's a kind of more modern, sleek, newer, high-end home, whether it's a commercial application, they wanted more than white. And so we actually offer the panel in both black or white. You get to choose uh, which flavor you wanna buy that in. Couple uh, quick features here, again, highlighting some, some things here and we'll spend more time on each of these. You've got the new IQ Base speaker desk stand. You've got the panel camera with the dual SRF. You've got PowerG and its great range. You've got all the notifications through alarm.com from the camera and other things. You've got a new uh, table mount, uh, messages, message center, and a whole lot more here. 
One of the other things we think a lot about is all the different verticals. So how can we use the same platform and the same software and then tune that or tweak that to be applicable in very specific verticals, right? So whether it's the residential vertical where, where maybe you want Bluetooth disarm or whether it's the SMB uh, commercial vertical where you need the UL 1610 or 2610 rating, you need four partitions, um, you need the advertising or wellness where you wanna get check-in pictures from the nurse, uh, from the nurses or MDU multifamily uh, where you're more focused on smart apartments. Uh, we really feel like this platform uh, can be targeted to those specific verticals. Even though it's all the same hardware and same software, you can essentially morph the panel to focus on key different areas uh, and different verticals across the platform. Uh, got some spinners, some side-by-sides here. Um, this really shows you the form factor of the panel. Um, it's super sleek, very thin, um, and you know everything fits inside, whether you put it on the wall, whether you put it on uh, the new table stand, or whether you put it on the IQ base that, we, that we're gonna get to here in a second. It's kind of up to you. So it's designed to have this really flexible architecture to fit your business needs or your customers' needs uh, here at the end user level. From a UI perspective, uh, we use the exact same UI as the Gen 2 panel. And this was an award-winning user interface that people just seem to love. It's dynamic, it's swipe-based, um, it's very easy to use. Um, and we only show the things uh, on, the, on the panel that are learned into it. Um, uh, so you're not going to see a bunch of icons or th things like that on the screen that aren't applicable uh, to that particular install. So for example, if you didn't have lights, you wouldn't have a light page. If you didn't have locks, you wouldn't have a lock page, for example. So it's just a very kind of dynamic, easy to use interface. Now, sneak peek, we are working on um, some new user interface as well that'll come out here uh, later, which will be a little more customizable and different but we are gonna keep the old user interface in place here or this user interface in place um, as people seem to love it. It makes training easy. It makes uh, tech support, sales, customer care, um, end users. It makes for a very easy transition between the Gen 2 panel and the Gen 4 panel. And for that reason, we like it a lot. Now it's designed for a consistent user experience, right? We want this to look and feel very much like the alarm.com experience, whether that's on the phone or tablet or watch or, or computer. Uh, they're really designed to have that kind of uh, similar uh, look and feel so that um, uh, customers uh, have that experience no matter the device they're on. Uh, this panel is, um, uh, this panel is uh, an all-in-one platform. Uh, it's kind of what we call a true all-in-one. So we have six different wireless radios embedded inside the panel. We have LTE, we have Wi-Fi, we have Bluetooth. Uh, it's got Power G and Z-Wave, and then one legacy radio, either 319, 345, or 433. It's also got the built-in camera, the battery, the siren, kind of everything all under the hood here at once. Um, pretty amazing how that gets done, and I want to spend a little bit more time talking about that. You know, sometimes we focus a lot on what you can see on the outside. We focus on the aesthetic, or we focus on maybe a, a feature a very specific feature like Bluetooth disarm or partitions or something in the software that we, we that we bring to the top level. But for me, what's you know as important, maybe more important than what you see on the outside is what you don't see on the inside. It's really this architecture, uh, this base platform we've designed, um, and we carry this forward from IQ Panel 2. IQ Panel 2 was very similar in design that enables. Uh, you know, the next five years of software updates and all the cool features that you do see. So what's inside really matters, I think, is the message here. Um, for us, I mentioned earlier, we start with a Qualcomm Snapdragon SOM. This is called a system on a module. This is an evolution beyond what we were doing on the Gen 2 panel. On that, we called it an SOC or a system on a chip. This is a further consolidation of components and parts. So we take about an additional 500 components and consolidate them down onto the module. Um, this module from Qualcomm is installed in, you know, millions and millions of devices worldwide, super robust platform to start from, um, and uh, we get a couple of things inherent with it. First is we get 4G LTE, so this has the built-in cell radio inside every single panel, and that could be with a Verizon SIM, an AT&T SIM, a TELUS SIM if you're in Canada, 
lots of you know three different flavors to get that in. Uh, but we also get Wi-Fi on board, and that's 802.11ac. Um, it's 2.4 and 5 gigahertz compatible, both uh, on every single panel. And we get Bluetooth, and the Bluetooth on this version is now 4.2 uh, BLE or Bluetooth Low Energy, uh, which is an improvement beyond what we had on the Gen 2 panel. We also get an access point, uh, so we can broadcast our own Wi-Fi in the home to connect cameras and keypads and things like that through that. We'll talk about that a little bit. And we start with Android 9. Now, if you remember, uh, IQ Panel 2 was on Android 5. So that's a pretty big leap forward um, uh, on the application layer uh, level or the operating system layer level uh, and gives us a lot of new capability that we'll be able to leverage over time. And, and we can increment that forward if we need to, uh, but that's our kind of our starting point. Now, once we go kind of further on the inside, uh, the daughter cards are where we really start to turn this into a security panel. This is where we start to add the proprietary radios that our industry relies on in order to make it function uh, in our ecosystem. And the very first daughter card that comes on every single panel is PowerG. Now, from the survey, most of you are installing PowerG. I'm betting uh, likely uh, more, more than most of you all know what PowerG is, even if you're not installing it today. Uh, but PowerG is our long range proprietary protocol. Um, it gets four to five times the range of any of the legacy security sensors that are out there. Um, so kind of that ultra long range and it's bi-directional. So we can talk back and forth to the sensors. We get a lot more information from them. They're 128 bit, you know, banking level encryption. Uh, and they do what's called 50 channel frequency hopping. And so what that allows is it allows the sensor to kind of automatically avoid interference. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about PowerG here in a second. But this is a phenomenal uh, technology that's included on every single panel. It just comes ready to go out of the box uh, as a daughter card. The other daughter card that comes standard on the panel, at least today, and this may change in the future, but at least today, we include uh, the Security RF daughter card. And this allows us to really kind of be what I think of a little bit more as backwards compatible with a whole lot of devices that our industry has installed over the last 20 or 30 years. And this could come in one of three different flavors. So we make it in the 319 megahertz flavor, and that's gonna work with all the Qualysys sensors, Qualysys S-Line, and most of the old Interlogix, ITI, GE security sensors that have been around for a long time. So that's really great if um, you're walking into a home and they've already got a bunch of those sensors there, you're able to reuse those sensors and then maybe add a bunch of PowerG sensors um, uh, for anything new that you're adding. Um, now, between these two daughter cards, we support up to 128 total sensors. Um, so um, you can mix and match those as much as you want. Um, so you could have, for example, 50 uh, S-Line or 319 uh, sensors on there, and you could have you know, another 78 PowerG sensors on there. So a very robust system. You can add a lot of different devices on, on this panel and really mix and match as much as you want between the different protocols um, and the panel can handle all that. Now, the other daughter cards that we make um, are the 345 megahertz daughter cards. Uh, and so you can get the panel with that pre-installed um, and that would come with either a Honey, or that's gonna support either Honeywell, Residio, or two gig sensors. And then we also make it in the 433 megahertz daughter card, which is gonna support the legacy DSC sensors. So any of those sensors that you had on like an Impasa or an Alexor or something like that uh, that are out there are going to work with that version of the panel. Um, now the third uh, radio here that we're, that we're adding is Z-Wave 700. Now I think most of you know that on uh, IQ Panel 2, that was a daughter card. On IQ Panel 4, again at least right now, uh, this is actually on the board. So we went away from the daughter card. We still have some flexibility to do that if we want to in the future. But uh, right now we're on the board um, and we support 137 total Z-Wave devices. And they break down into the following categories, 80 lights, 20 locks, 10 thermostats, six garage door openers, and what we say is 21 other devices. And another device would be anything that's not a light lock thermostat or garage door. So it could be a Z-Wave water valve, it could be a Z-Wave siren or a dedicated Z-Wave repeater uh, as an example to name a few. So 
Between this, you can see, again, we're supporting a very large ecosystem of devices, whether it's PowerG, SRF, Z-Wave, different Z-Wave devices that are out there, um, really a robust uh, uh, ecosystem of devices that can be supported. And on Z-Wave, by the way, this new Z-Wave 700 chip, along with our redesign, uh, we get about two and a half times the range on Z-Wave that we had on IQ Panel 2 Plus. And that, that version already had very, very good Z-Wave range. And this comes down to that concept I mentioned of better, faster, stronger on all the radios. So all of these radios have been tuned for better range, better performance. On PowerG, we go to this onboard. Let's see if I get my mouse here. Oh, sorry, guys. We go to this onboard 915 antenna here. So we change the, the, uh, the PowerG antenna design. Same sensors, same daughter card, different antenna, different tuning. Uh, and we get better PowerG range than ever before. Same on the security RF side. We no longer have that little pigtail antenna you have to stick in the wall. Uh, that is no more. We're able to bring the antenna inside the enclosure and have that tuned uh, for each of these different frequencies. Um, and so we get great range on security RF and then same on Z-Wave 700. Totally different antenna design, different tuning there. Now, aside from all the other daughter cards and radios on here, we have uh, what we call an expansion slot. And we had this on the Gen 2 panel. We left this here on the Gen 4 panel. Um, we really like this expansion slot. This gives us the ability to uh, kind of morph and adapt over time. Maybe it's some type of new radio technology uh, that we haven't yet integrated with. Um, maybe it's uh, the need to pivot to a different technology for a specific market segment or need like Zigbee um, or other types of devices. We could add a different daughter card here uh, and be able to, uh, to kind of adapt to that in the hardware. So not only do we have this flexible, updatable software, but we've got some room in the hardware to kind of uh, adapt as well as needed. So that's kind of a lot of different, a lot of information here. I hope you guys are typing in questions. I'm going to pause real quick uh, and ask Neil and crew here if we have any kind of pertinent questions, maybe for the whole crowd, any kind of themes popping up here as we're going so far. If not, that's okay. I'll continue. But I wanted to take a moment to stop here for a sec. Yeah, we're going to have a few questions, but the one thing we want to do is it seems that the original poll for the sensor technologies did not run properly. It was not letting people check all that apply. So, Kev, if you're good, I'm just going to run it one more time just so we can get that data. So, again, yeah, sorry, folks, for interrupting with a poll, but let's get this one hopefully working right this time. There we go. While we're doing that, Kev, we have a question of, are there any planned revisions for the panel camera to have infrared so that it can see better uh, in, in darker spaces? Yeah, it's a great question. So we have talked a lot about different ways to do that. Um, we actually do potentially in the future have some provisioning in here for some IRs. Um, inside next to the two LEDs here. Um, but uh, we also can do some other things in software potentially like flash the screen at night to kind of light it up, very similar to the way a phone would do that in a dark lit room. Um, so we're, we're looking at that from a software and hardware perspective both and kind of seeing different ways that we can get, we can get creative in uh, environments where uh, it's not as conducive to light. So something that's being looked at right now. And I think you're going to address this later, but we'll uh, bring it up anyway as we're, since we have a pause. Uh, there is some questions regarding the backlight and if we uh, are uh, going to come up with some solutions for some tampers. Yeah, we'll hold that. We'll hold that for a few more slides here. We've got a whole bunch of stuff on the backlight, so definitely a, a, a good question. Uh, that's it for now. Thank you. All right. Perfect. All right. So uh, kind of coming from the inside back to the outside here, when you put that entire architecture together, when you take all the different uh, daughter cards and, and things that we can do, we essentially end up with what we call three flavors of the panel. And so these are the ways that it can be bought in the marketplace today. Uh, you can buy what we call a gold box panel, which is a PowerG 319 panel. And then that would have three SKUs of its own, Verizon, AT&T, or TELUS, depending on which SIM card you need. You can buy a red box panel, which is going to be PowerG 433. 
supporting the DSC sensors. And again, the three different SIM card flavors. And then you can have a silver box panel, which is PowerG345, again, supporting uh, legacy Honeywell and two gig sensors, uh, along with the three SIM card flavors of that. And then don't forget, it comes in black or white. So lots of different SKUs to choose from uh, based on your need, what you're looking for. And uh, it makes for a very, very flexible solution where you can walk into just about any home, take over what they have installed uh, over the last 20 years, add to it, bring it up to date, make it more modern, um, and uh, really give them the latest and greatest while, while leveraging what we've been doing as an industry for, for a long time and not necessarily throwing that away. So we've heard from many of you that this is, uh, you know, brings enormous value prop to, to your business and your ability to tackle just about anything in your install base or anything you run into that's, uh, that's been out there in the marketplace today. Uh, I want to spend a little bit more time talking about PowerG, especially for those who don't know a lot about it. Um, it uh, it's really is a game changer. And for that, I've got a quick video here, a 30 second video that we'll, that we'll watch. Beach cooler open. All right, so kind of a fun video. Uh, you know, I don't think you're going to have many customers ask for a sensor on their cooler <laughs> that they can take down to the beach, uh, but uh, hopefully the messaging rings true that these are awesome uh, when it comes to range. Uh, you saw in that video that was about 4,000 feet. Um, now, if you've ever gone out and range tested 4,000 feet, it's an incredibly long way. You can't you can't see that far. <laughs> uh, when we do a lot of our range testing, you can't even see the panel at that point. You're so far away. Um, and of course, that's open air range, but it gives you a, a really good baseline uh, for what you might be able to do in the real world. Um, and so PowerG is just a super cool technology. It's got this ultra long range and this encryption. It's got this frequency hopping. Um, one of my favorite things, and we'll spend a little bit of time on this later, is the portfolio of devices that are available to you, right? And that, that really matters. We'll talk about that. Um, one of the other interesting things I don't think we've mentioned yet is that PowerG does uh, adaptive battery management. So basically it knows how far away it is from the panel. And uh, if it needs to yell a little louder, um, it can do that. If it can talk a little softer and save battery because it's a little closer to the panel, it'll do that. So it's a really unique way at managing the uh, transmit power and the battery life on the sensor based on that exact installation environment and that exact need. Um, now we do support up to eight repeaters on PowerG, which is which is amazing. Um, they don't cascade, so you won't go repeater to repeater to repeater, for example, but you can go on what we call a star diagram. And so imagine if you had a, the panel near the center of the building and you added repeaters kind of in a star or in a circle around the panel, how much further you could go. Um, you're talking really, really long distances uh, on, on PowerG. Just a, just a phenomenal protocol. And again, those that have used it, uh, pretty much don't ever don't ever switch back to anything else. It's just that good. Okay, I'm going to spend a little bit of time here on the panel camera. Uh, we go to a uh, an eight megapixel, 120 degree wide angle lens with something that we call flex tilt uh, for even better disarm photos and alarm videos. You know, we've always had a panel camera you know, since day one uh, uh, of our of our IQ line panels, and uh, this is just the best camera we've ever put in a panel, just that much better. And you're gonna see some really cool things coming in the future through software updates that we'll be doing with this panel camera through alarm.com. Um, but today, uh, it takes a really great disarm photos and alarm videos. Um, one of the things we did is we went from kind of a, a regular field of view to a wide field of view. So you're gonna be able to capture a lot more from this camera than you were able to on an IQ panel two. And that really helps depending on the installation environment and where it's mounted. And then the other thing, of course, is the actual uh, flex tilt adjustment here. And this is a mechanical adjustment, the ability to really change the angle of the camera up or down 
in addition to that uh, to that wide angle lens. Um, you know, sometimes I've, I've done a lot of installs where the legacy keypad that was there was not in an ideal location for a panel camera. Maybe it was a little bit too low, maybe it was a little bit too high. You're trying to cover old paint or wallpaper, things like that at your installation. And you really need the ability to adjust uh, where that camera is aimed. And uh, Flex Tilt helps a lot with that. And that's just a, a simple mechanism on the top with a worm drive screw. And of course, uh, just like Gen 2, these, uh, these images can be pushed out across the ecosystem. They're stored on the panel, but you can get them on your phone or watch or computer. They can come in push notification, text, email, all sorts of ways that Alarm.com can deliver those to you. You can even peek in now or peek in next motion. So directly from the app, you can request an image on demand, or you can request an image that says, hey, next time somebody walks in front of the panel, then give me that image, uh, uh, which is really, really nice. Now we also do alarm videos. So we don't just do still images, we actually do full video recording. Today, these recordings are local to the panel only. The video doesn't transfer to alarm.com, but that's something that we're working on. And we've had some amazing stories over the years where you know people break in, um, the siren goes off, they run right up to the panel. You get a really good video of them standing right there at the panel. Um, and these videos can be offloaded from the panel as well. So uh, really, really cool feature here on Alarm videos. And again, you're going to see us do a lot more in the future uh, with the actual built-in panel camera. The quad sound speakers. Uh, you know, we significant. This is one of the most visual uh, changes from IQ Panel 2 to IQ Panel 4. We've got a lot of feedback on these. A lot of people asking about the speakers. Um, and, uh, you know, over the years, we had a lot of people say they wish the sound was louder on, on the panel than it was on Gen 2. On Gen 2, we had two very small speakers on the side of the panel. We had two of them. They were one watt each. On, on the Gen 4 panel here, we have four four watt speakers. So a significant difference in overall audio volume on the panel, whether you're using that for two-way voice and want to have this nice, loud central station experience, whether you're just using it kind of every day for chimes and, and comings and goings and things like that, or whether you're choosing to use the new uh, Bluetooth music streaming feature we'll talk about here in a second, it's kind of up to you. But having this really good audio experience in the home, we heard time and time again uh, people asking for, and so that's kind of where this comes from. We've got the IQ base, of course, uh, and I mentioned earlier the three microphones. So not only did we improve the speakers, but we actually improved the microphones on the panel. So uh, Gen 2 had two microphones and IQ Panel 4 has three microphones, two front facing, one rear facing, and they have what we call echo noise cancellation. And so again, that makes for a much better audio experience, especially in two-way voice, but maybe even just in a doorbell situation where you're talking back and forth from the panel to the doorbell or from the panel to the alarm.com cameras, having that additional sound and mic both working together uh, makes for a much improved experience uh, in the hardware. Garage door open. Awesome. Again, I know those videos are a little bit choppy on GoToWebinar here. They're great in person, and we have all these videos posted on our website and on our YouTube page. Um, but uh, IQ Bass really takes that sound level to that next experience. So uh, we have a lot of uh, a lot of our customers. I think most of our customers mount on the wall. Is fair to say, but we have a good amount of our customers that do table mount installs. And IQ Bass is a great way to upgrade that table mount install. Um, even if you're a professional security dealer, right? Um, and uh, it really just kind of rounds out that sound. It adds that uh, that 
that uh, bass or that depth of feel and really makes that Bluetooth streaming sound um, a lot better. Now, one of the cool things is the way that this is designed is this is kind of like bring your own favorite music. So whether you like Spotify or Apple Music or Pandora or whatever your music app happens to be, um, we actually support kind of all of them um, because it just loads from your phone and then Bluetooth streams directly to the panel, much like it might do on a Bluetooth speaker you have around the home already. So really flexible uh, in the way that customers can go ahead and use that. Uh, one, of the, one of the features I'm most excited about, and some of you mentioned the mounting here a little bit, is, is what we call smart mount. And so we're going to spend a few minutes talking uh, about smart mount here real quick. Um, again, uh, we had a lot of feedback on the Gen 2 panel that it was difficult to close. Um, it took a lot of training. It took a lot of effort. And uh, we really wanted to try and improve upon that experience. And so we've come up with what we call smart mount. And this is designed to be a lot easier to get on the wall. Um, and so uh, I want to show you this quick video here. All right, so as you can see there, this is really designed to be an interchangeable system, whether you're using the wall plate, and I've got one here, uh, this, this wall bracket, or whether you're using the table stand, or maybe you're using the actual base here. This is all designed to just simply uh, snap into place here. And um, you can choose which one you want. Um, now, one of the things um, that we, did uh, specifically different on the wall mount was this little terminal block here. So I can get that up on my camera. And this terminal block is designed to provide a much more hands-free experience, mounting experience. Basically, you can wire directly to this terminal block, and when you snap the panel into place, uh, it actually uh, gets power through a, through a blade connector directly on this terminal block. And um, we've had a lot of good, uh, good feedback from the tech so far that say they really like this makes it much easier to install. We still have the barrel jack on the panel. If that's something you want to use, you can still use the barrel jack. We ship it with a transformer and a barrel cord, um, so you can do that. But maybe you're hooking up to an existing wire, or you had to trim your wire to a certain length. You're able to actually use that, uh, that custom terminal block here on the back plate. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit of time here later in the training on some of the changes coming to this back plate. Even this new and improved backplate, uh, we heard kind of loud and clear from some of our early adopters here that uh, they wanted some additional changes to it to make it even easier to install. And so I've got some of those mock-ups here on my desk, and I'll show you guys that here in a little bit, uh, some of those changes that are coming to the backplate here uh, soon. So Neil, with that, we're kind of at another good stopping point here before we move on. Any, any pertinent questions that maybe isn't, that should be for the broader audience here? Uh, we've had a couple of questions on when we sh are, should be seeing the 345 and 433 flavors of the panel. That okay, I can address that. So the PowerG 319 panel is available right now, so you can buy that today. Um, the PowerG 345 panel, we just started producing now, so those will start to show up probably next week or the week after. They're essentially just about to be available. They're kind of a work in progress right now and shipping soon. And then the PowerG 433 panels, you'll see early to mid-December. They're about a month behind. So it's kind of this staggered rollout. Launched with PowerG 319, PowerG 345 is about to hit here imminently, and then PowerG 433 is coming a month from now. So hopefully that uh, helps with that. Joel, Mark, do we have any other questions that were pending? I don't see any. No, that was the big one you just asked. Hey, just a quick comment too from, uh, I, we know some of you guys haven't been able to see the videos as well as you would have liked. I'm gonna go ahead and put a link to the uh, playlist of some of our IQ Panel 4 videos that, that have been shown in the presentation today in the chat. So feel free to grab that link and watch them later. You'll be able to see those in their entirety and of course share them on social media, share them with other colleagues, et cetera. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, we dropped the Facebook groups in the chat as well, so all of the different Facebook groups are in there. 
All right, perfect. Thank you, guys. Okay, we'll move on here. So one of the coolest things about IQ Panel 4 is that not only do we have all this different wireless protocol that we support, right, and everything we've talked about so far, but we support hardwired sensors in a lot of different ways as well, and I want to spend a couple quick minutes on that. So one of the one of the hardwired translators we make is called the Hardwire 16F. Now this is specifically on the 319 protocol, the S-Line protocol. So this is going to work with the PowerG 319 panel we talked about, the Gold Box panel, um, and these all come in kind of gold boxes. So that kind of helps keep it easy. You can match that up. Um, but the Hardwire 16F comes in two different sizes of enclosures. The 7133, we call that the small enclosure, and the 7134, we call the large enclosure. And this is really designed to adapt to your installation needs. Maybe you just need a really small takeover enclosure that'll fit inside an existing can. This is designed to do that. It's got an external antenna that pokes up outside of the metal can for that very reason. And uh, these are stackable all the way up to 128 zones. So each module supports 16 zones. And again, you can stack those up to the 128 zone panel limit. Um, zone 16 is dedicated for two wire fire. So we support two wire smokes. And again, you can buy it in the small enclosure or the large enclosure. The large enclosure is designed to fit two modules and two batteries. And again, you can stack as many of those up as you need to get to, to, get to your need. So a really cool way to take over hardwired devices and you can kind of mix and match hardwire and wireless on any install with this as well. Probably my favorite is our new, uh, my favorite hardwire, and I didn't want to call this a hardwire translator anymore because it's so much more than that. Our favorite hardwire module, almost hardwire panel, is our, our PowerG hardwire uh, device. And uh, this is really so much more than just taking hardwired sensors and turning them into a wireless signal. This basically is a full control panel. We have a core bus on board, so you can wire up your four wire keypads. Um, uh, we have uh, PGMs for programmable outputs. You can do all kinds of gate triggers and different relays. Uh, we support two wire smoke or two wire fire, four wire fire, four wire CO. So it really is uh, a robust hardwire panel that interfaces with IQ Panel 4. Um, each module has eight zones on board. You can stack two modules together on a panel. So that'll give you a total of 16 hardwired zones uh, off this PowerG hardwire module. And coming in an update here in the next probably two months-ish, um, we will have brand new firmware out for the hardwire module called the 1.2 firmware. The panel on IQ Panel 2 will be 2.7. On IQ Panel 4, it'll be 4.1. Um, and that will allow us to support uh, zone expanders as well as auxiliary power supplies. So you won't be limited to the, to the 16 zones as you're limited to today on this module. Each module will take four zone expanders for a total of 40 zones per module. So that'll get you all the way up to 80 hardwired zones, uh, plus all your keypads and your fire and all that kind of stuff as well. So really, really cool device. It's kind of taking off in all sorts of different ways. Um, and really is blurring those lines between an older hybrid uh, control panel and a panel like IQ Panel 4 that supports hybrid uh, style features and functions. So uh, we're, we're loving this one right now and it's uh, kind of taking on a whole roadmap all of its own, uh, which is kind of nice. Now on the secondary keypads, a lot of you ask us about secondary keypads. Okay, so beyond uh, the main control panel, what type of wireless secondary keypads do you offer? We have the IQ Remote. This is a seven inch secondary touchscreen. It works on Wi-Fi, so you gotta have good Wi-Fi and we'll talk more about that later. It's our third generation uh, flavor and we support up to three of these per panel. We also support the DSC PowerG wire-free keypad, a couple different versions of it. And we support up to five of those on a panel. So if you were to kind of mix it, you can mix and match by the way, if, you're, if you did that, you'd have a total of eight secondary wireless keypads supported on the panel, plus the main panel itself. So lots of different options here, um, just based on your actual installation, whether you wanna go Wi-Fi route or the PowerG route. Um, I'll give a, a sneak peek. We, we are working on kind of smashing these two products together, meaning we're working on having a PowerG touchscreen keypad as well. And you'll see something from us on that uh, here early uh, early in 2022, uh, which is going to be really exciting. 
One of the other kind of defining features of IQ Panel 4 is the built-in panel glass break. Again, we use these awesome three microphones. Uh, we tune up the software and we can listen for, for panel glass break. I often call this the world's best glass break sensor. You know, it's got a lot of horsepower. It's always running. It doesn't have to conserve battery. It's on AC. It's got three microphones. The algorithm can be changed and updated through software over time. It's a really nice feature to be able to have a built-in glass break detector inside the panel, depending on where you put that panel inside the home. Bluetooth disarm, of course, this is a carryover from IQ Panel 2 as well. If you're not familiar with it, we're able to essentially use your phone much like a prox tag or much like an access control tag where we authenticate off your phone over Bluetooth. We can automatically disarm the system. We can drive rules off that um, to unlock your door or turn on your porch lights, but only after dusk. So lots of cool things we can do off the Bluetooth disarm signal. And we support up to five phones being paired to the panel simultaneously. Now this only works from away mode. So uh, it doesn't work from stay mode, obviously. In stay, you're probably staying. In way, you should be going away. Uh, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how this works on the technical side here in just a little bit. One of the things we like to do is to pair this with geofencing, alarm.com's geofence. So we like to say use geofence when you're leaving, use Bluetooth disarm when you're coming home. That way you're, you're pretty much within 30 to 50 feet of your panel. When it disarms, you're on your property or on your doorstep by the time that happens, which is nice. All right, one of the really cool things we can do is what we call live answer. This gives us the ability to view the video doorbell directly on the panel screen. Um, you get the pop-up notification that you can answer that doorbell. You can talk back and forth right from the panel. You can uh, unlock the door. Um, you can disarm the security system, all directly from this interface on the panel via the doorbell integration. And we support uh, all the alarm.com doorbells, whether it's the SkyBell or the new V770. They're all supported on IQ Panel 4 um, uh, with this feature. We also support a live view with audio from alarm.com cameras. So if the camera supports audio, we will as well, meaning you can talk back and forth. Maybe it's a baby monitor, maybe it's just having a conversation with uh, someone else uh, through the panel to the camera, but we can also view and uh, talk back and forth through these, through these cameras uh, on the panel. We can also do that on the secondary keypads. Now, know that on the secondary keypad, we don't get audio yet. That's maybe something we can bring to the forefront in the future. We do have a microphone on, the, on it, as you can see. Uh, so today, for the secondary devices, it's video only, uh, no audio. One of the great things about the panel is that we have a panel access point. Again, this allows it to broadcast its own hotspot into the home. Uh, you can think of this as a Wi-Fi extender. Um, uh, maybe you want to connect your doorbell directly to the panel and then have the panel hop it back to the router. You can do that. Maybe you want to connect your secondary keypad directly to the panel. You can do that. The one thing to be conscious of is range here, of course. You want to make sure that uh, wherever it's broadcasting or wherever you put your panel is that the devices that you're trying to connect to it are in range uh, uh, of this. But this can, I really think of this as an arrow in your quiver. This is something you can use when needed. Uh, when the installation environment uh, permits it. Uh, this is a, a great capability to have directly on the panel. Of course, we have dual path on every panel, so we communicate over Wi-Fi and LTE simultaneously. And we support, I think, 16 or 17 different languages now um, directly on the panel interface. You can toggle those with a single button uh, between two different languages. We call that the, uh, the language toggle. Um, so maybe you're installing in an area where they speak a lot of Spanish uh, and you might have English and Spanish speakers in the home. You can quickly toggle between the two. It's not a separate SKU you have to order or something fixed. You can just do it in programming. Maybe you're in Canada where there's a lot of French speakers. Uh, same thing there. You can toggle between English and French. Or maybe you're in a completely different country um, uh, and you want a totally different language. Uh, you can do that as well. Partitions. So we support up to four partitions with what we call global arming. This could be a guest house or a detached garage, or this could be in a full-blown commercial space. Um, really flexible here on the way that we that we do these partitions. Uh, secondary keypads all get assigned to a partition, um, and then you can have global access at the main panel, depending on which code you use to get into the panel, uh, determines which level of access you have to on the partition. 
We can even do Bluetooth disarm by partition. So if somebody's phone, when it comes into range through Bluetooth disarm, if you only want that phone to disarm partition two, you can do that. If you want another phone to disarm partition one, you can do that. So you can kind of assign these phones to different partitions as well, which is really, really cool. The home control page is a, a pretty unique page. This is an optional page that can be turned on at the panel in settings. And this is really designed uh, especially for smart apartments or what we call MDU, multifamily. Um, oftentimes, smart apartments only have one lock, you know, one thermostat, and maybe one light. And being able to bring that to the front of the panel and have kind of an automation panel um, where you present all that on a single quick intuitive page is something we wanted to be able to do. So this is a toggle inside settings. You could turn it on or turn it off. You even have the ability, ability to turn off the security page. Many of you are getting into automation only um, business models where uh, you offer security as an option and then uh, you're leading with automation. And this really allows the panel to be flexible enough to do that. You don't always have to have security. You can, you can run it as an automation only system should you choose. And same thing for wellness. Uh, again, another vertical that we think a lot about, the aging in place category or the wellness category. We wanted the ability to be able to turn the panel into a wellness panel. Now, again, you can run this as a, as a standalone page so that all the panel has is wellness and this can act like a PERS base station for an elderly, uh, an elderly person where you don't wanna confuse them with arming and disarming and all that kind of stuff. You can have it be a very simplified UI just for wellness or you can actually have this as an add-on in addition to all the standard pages you're used to. And again, this is just a, uh, a, a setting inside uh, the installation settings bucket. You can turn this page on or off. You can even have a check-in, check-out button where instead of using the panel camera to take a picture on disarm, it actually takes a picture on check-in and check-out. And so that would be for like a caregiver or a nurse, somebody who's coming by and you want that picture to be sent out uh, uh, to the other caretakers to know kind of who's coming by and when. It's all time stamped. We support scenes on the panel, and this is uh, all populated over from alarm.com, so this all stays in sync. If you set up scenes on alarm.com, they can be set up here kind of automatically. The icons, the colors, all the different rules for these scenes push down to the panel so they run instantly. Um, so a really nice option to be able to have this on. And again, this is, a, this is an optional um, uh, choice in programming that you can turn on or off. And then the easy install wizard. We'll spend more time on this later as well, but the ability to have fast, efficient, consistent installs and to kind of customize what shows up in the wizard is a really unique feature. We support Smart Start, uh, which if you don't know a lot about Smart Start, it's the ability to learn in a Z-Wave device without having it powered on. You do that via a QR code. You can use the panel camera to actually scan this QR code. It'll kind of pre-learn the device into the system. And then when you go plug the device in or power it up later, it automatically syncs with the system. This is great for, um, you know, if maybe for shipping to a customer, uh, this is great if you don't want to walk around the house a whole bunch um, or great for like remote troubleshooting and support. Maybe where you're trying to help a customer learn something in uh, over the phone, which is nice. The advanced sensor test, we have a whole bunch of different sensor tests on the panel here as well. And the advanced sensor test is, is one of the best. This really allows you to actually see the RF signal strength in the home and um, right there on the panel so you can get it right before you leave. Uh, oftentimes, uh, I find that technicians kind of install it, they make sure it's chiming, they cross their fingers, and then a day or two later, uh, they get a sensor failure or an RF fail, and they have to go back and kind of try to figure out why the sensor went into failure. And this really uh, makes the invisible visible. This allows you to see exactly what's going on in the home. You can adjust the sensor, you can move it up, you can move it down, you can turn it vertical to horizontal, you can install a repeater, you can decide you need to go power G, but this test on board every single panel really gives you the information you need to be able to uh, gauge the install at the time of the install so you get it right before you leave the house. And then same thing on Z-Wave. We have a whole bunch of Z-Wave diagnostics and Z-Wave tools uh, directly on the panel that allow you to see that mesh network. And we'll talk more about those a little bit later. Lastly, uh, a bunch of other health tests are, are included on the panel as well, like Wi-Fi and daughter cards and panel glass break and all kinds of other tests here that we'll, that we'll talk a little bit about. 
Now, I mentioned earlier the PowerG portfolio. Um, you know, one of my favorite things about the Power, PowerG portfolio is just that it's so robust. Oftentimes, when you look at a sensor portfolio, you might have a couple of different door sensors, maybe one or two different motion sensors to choose from. Uh, in the PowerG portfolio, we have a lot. I think we have like at least five different styles of door window sensors. We've got indoor and outdoor and recessed and commercial and big and small and all kinds of different sensors. I think we have 10 different motion detectors based on the application you're trying to choose, whether it's a commercial dual tech motion or a residential PIR motion or one with a camera, an outdoor, a curtain, all kinds of different motion detectors. So just a really robust sensor line to choose from from PowerG. And I think that's one of the uh, the big benefits of PowerG as well. Now we also make a whole S-Line sensor line. Um, so a lot of different sensors to choose from here on S-Line as well, which is a little bit uh, uh, more entry level line than PowerG. And we support a whole host of Z-Wave devices. We're always certifying new devices. Um, we're backwards compatible with 300 series, 500 series Z-Wave Plus, and of course, all the new 700 series Z-Wave devices uh, kind of work better than ever. So there's a whole list of devices that we support here. Um, I want to, we're almost done with the overview section here, guys, but before we, we move into some of the installation and programming, I want to bring your awareness to a couple of new devices we've been working on that integrate with IQ Panel 4. Um, and that we think are really, really important to, uh, to our space. And uh, one of those is water. And, you know, for a lot of us, and I've got a, got a flood sensor here, for a lot of us, we've been doing these flood sensors for a long time, right? And um, that's not all that unique, um, the ability to detect water um, in the event that you need to and send a signal outside the home. Again, I think probably everybody on this call does water in some form or fashion from a flood sensor. Um, but beyond just being able to sense that there's water, we want to be able to do something about that. We want to be able to turn the water off. And um, historically, you know, again, there are smart shutoff valves that are out there. Um, and historically, they're really expensive. They need a plumber. Um, uh, they cost a lot of money. And so we find that the penetration in true water management is less than 1% of all the installs actually have some true water management. We wanted to change that. And so we came up with a device um, that's uh, super easy to install, doesn't require a plumber, works on Z-Wave 700, and is something that you can essentially add to just about any install in the country, um, whether it's ahead of time as the sales part of the sales process or even as an upgrade as part of the installation process. And so, again, I've got a quick video on that. I'll play it, and uh, hopefully it plays well enough for you to uh, capture the feel of what we're doing here. All right, so as you can see, super easy to install. In fact, I've got one, well, I think I do, yep. I've got one here behind me on this uh, little plumbing stand here. And this will work with uh, essentially any quarter turn ball valve uh, for the most part uh, that's out there. We think that this will uh, work on at least 80% of the valves that are in the market today. Um, so it's not gonna fit every valve, but it's gonna fit a lot of them. And once you do one or two of these, you'll know just by looking at the valve whether or not it's supported by this device. Uh, it simply screws on with two thumb screws here. So I'm gonna take this off for you real quick. So it's super easy to take on and off. And again, it's Z-Wave 700 and, and just pairs directly to the panel. This is literally a, a five minute install. There it is, it's reinstalled. And I think on we had a whole webinar just on this device uh, a couple months ago. And I think uh, Jason, who did the webinar, actually had his four-year-old uh, do the install. So that gives you a good example of how easy this is uh, to program uh, and, to, and to install. Um, it comes in two different kits. 
So uh, the first kit comes with three S-Line flood sensors, and the second kit comes with two Power-G flood sensors. So you get to choose. Do you want a Power-G kit? Do you want an S-Line kit? Based on that particular install, they cost the same. Uh, by the way, they're designed to kind of be priced identically, um, and then you just choose which, which version you want, which is kind of nice. Okay, and then I want to uh, introduce you guys to IQ Wi-Fi and spend a little bit of time talking about Wi-Fi here. Uh, you know, the way that I think about Wi-Fi in the home um, is that it's the last thing that we don't control oftentimes uh, as a dealer community, as a professional installation uh, community here. Um, when you think about everything that you install, um, it's all managed. It's all purpose built. It's all designed to work and to be very, very reliable. So when you install a panel, it's got a managed cellular inside of the home. You're not using somebody's phone or, or hotspot in the phone in, in the home to use the cellular connection. No, you're installing a dedicated cellular connection. Even the Z-Wave, which is kind of an open protocol, um, uh, in the uh, it, it, Z-Wave is an open protocol, it's still managed by you. It's basically locked down where you control which devices come into the Z-Wave network. You've got all the tools built in. You can make sure it works. You can Make sure that the door locks and thermostats are going to be reliable. All the sensors you install are reliable and, and kind of owned by you. And the only thing that's often not owned by you is the Wi-Fi. Um, and you, we'll go into a home and we'll make sure everything's working. And then we'll say, hey, which, which Wi-Fi network do you have? I want to connect to it. And we kind of connect to people's existing Wi-Fi networks in the home as if they're this awesome, great, reliable Wi-Fi networks. Um, even though we know that's not the case, they're not, right? They're often using a, a free router or a modem. Um, they've got dead spots. They've got kids and all kinds of devices streaming to it. The ISPs are pushing software updates or firmware updates down in the middle of the night. And so we really think it's from a strategic perspective for our industry, for you, for us, for our kind of ecosystem, it's very important to own that Wi-Fi network in the home or at least own the network that we're gonna connect to. And so that's where IQ Wi-Fi comes in. And IQ Wi-Fi is a purpose-built purpose -built mesh router. Um, it's designed for you to install it in the home. It's designed to work with alarm.com cameras. It's designed to work with the panel with secondary keypads. Um, I'll show you some more slides here. It integrates directly with the panel. Um, and this particular version is designed to either be installed as the standalone router for the entire home, and you can allow them to connect to it if you want, or it's also designed to be used in parallel to an existing network and not have IP address conflicts and things like that. So if you want to isolate your gear on their network and just connect your stuff to this, you can do that as well. Um, now I mentioned that it integrates directly with the panel. This allows for setup uh, directly on the panel interface. You don't have to get out your laptop or you don't have to surf to a web page in order to set up the router. You can actually set this up directly from the panel screen, just like you do all your other devices, your Z-Wave and your sensors and everything else. Um, so that makes for a really nice kind of consistent installation experience if you're a technician, being able to configure and manage and set it up directly from the panel. And very soon, this is something that's coming um, here in short order, you're also going to be able to set up and control this from alarm.com. So you'll have remote visibility directly from um, both on the customer side. This is an example of the end user website here, but you can the customer will be able to control certain aspects from their side if you want them to, but also from the dealer side, being able to remotely reboot the routers, remotely see connectivity stats, what's connected to what. Um, so really giving you the tools to be able to to set up this purpose-built network and then manage it um, going forward uh, is, is really the goal here on that. Um, and so, you know, what we're hoping here is that uh, this will significantly reduce uh, your truck rolls. I think it's uh, probably a true statement that just about everybody will tells us, um, you know, network issues are a number one truck roll, right? We, hear, we just hear that time and time again. Um, as an industry, we're no longer rolling out to troubleshoot sensors or panels most of the time we're rolling out to, to troubleshoot Wi-Fi. And so again, kind of owning and maintaining and <clears throat> ensuring a quality experience here on the Wi-Fi network side is something that we think is very important. Now, this is out and available now. Um, we are working on a next generation product as well called IQ Wi-Fi 6. And if you know very much about 
Wi-Fi 6. It's just a faster, uh, kind of better Wi-Fi technology uh, that uh, most people are kind of migrating to over time. So this is also in the works, but very similar value prop to, um, to what we have on IQ Wi-Fi. Now, IQ Wi-Fi 6 also has an end user app. So again, if you want to offer kind of whole home network and allow the customer to uh, connect IQ to IQ Wi-Fi, they can do that. Uh, we can kind of have uh, a separate partition for security devices and home devices so they don't mess with that kind of stuff. They can set up profiles, they can pause their Wi-Fi at dinner time, and they can really kind of help manage that network uh, on your behalf if you want them to. We also have a wall mount bracket should, that, uh, should you choose to use it. Uh, oftentimes there isn't a place to set these routers. Maybe you don't want it on a nightstand or on a bookshelf or a mantle or something like that or hidden behind a desk. Uh, getting it up off the floor uh, is, uh, is nice to be able to do and so they come with a wall mount bracket as well. And again, IQ Wi-Fi is available now and IQ Wi-Fi 6 is coming soon. So with that, you guys, that was a lot. Um, and uh, that was the end of the overview section here. Um, we've discussed pretty much all these things that are popping up here on the screen. Uh, we've, we've spent uh, quite a bit of time here already. And um, I want to pause here for a moment before we dive into kind of the actual installation uh, portion of the, of the training here. Any questions uh, from the audience on this kind of overview baseline of IQ Panel 4? Um, there is one question, Kev. Can Bluetooth disarming be assigned to partitions or is it all global? It can be. Yeah, it can be assigned to a partition. So you can uh, you can set it up so a specific phone will only disarm a specific partition automatically as, as part of the Bluetooth disarm. So, yep, you set that up. Very similar to a device. Uh, when you pair a phone to the panel, it actually takes up a zone just like a, a door sensor would and you assign it to a partition and then it would control that exact partition um, when you do that so pretty easy to do that perfect um can you set so back to the bluetooth we're getting a lot of questions on bluetooth <clears throat> can it be set up to disarm all partitions or just one great question i, I believe <laughs> my right now. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to test it while we're talking here. I believe the answer is yes. I think it can be assigned more to more than one partition, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Actually, I'm going to say, I'm going to go against myself. I'm going to say no. I think it's designed to, to only pair to a single partition at a time. Kind of like a key fob or a, uh, a sensor, for example. All and right. You are, and you are correct. It will only part, uh, pair to one of the partitions. There you go. So it can only control one partition. A user code can control multiple partitions, but a Bluetooth phone, a device like a key fob or a phone is going to be assigned to a specific partition. Okay. Right. On Bluetooth. Yep. Um, again, a bunch of questions, just a bunch of questions on Bluetooth. Um, do we have any plans to expand to more than five phones? And with this panel, has, blue, has the Bluetooth range increased? So uh, we can definitely look at going to more than five phones. We, I wouldn't say we've actually had that request much. If you think that's something you're running into, let us know. It's just a, it's a soft software limitation. There's no hard limit to that. So that's something we can definitely do in a future software update. So let us know. Make sure to talk to us about that. And then I would say, yes, range has uh, increased on the Bluetooth. Um, uh, you know, range was pretty good on IQ Panel 2. It was something like 30 to, to 50 feet. It should be that uh, on IQ Panel 4 as well. So pretty, pretty close. I, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but um, definitely should be better. We did go from 4.0 to 4.2. So it's a newer standard of the, of the Bluetooth standard. Anything else? All right, well, take a stretch break here. Uh, we're gonna dive right into the, uh, to the, the panel programming and get right into the nitty gritty here. So appreciate everybody hanging in there.
and hopefully you uh, you learned something new from that overview section. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about the actual hardware. Now these are uh, screenshots directly out of the installation manual here. So if you if you have that, you can go back and find these anytime you'd like. Um, but here on the front of the panel, you see our dual microphones here on the top of the screen. Uh, we also have one on the back I'll show you here in a second. Uh, so we have two microphones and two LEDs right there. We have our, our new eight megapixel panel camera. On the upper right hand side, we have an ambient light sensor. That's brand new for IQ Panel 4. We didn't have that on IQ Panel 2. That allows us to automatically dim the UI and the screen based on the light in the room so it's not so bright, which is kind of nice. We've got our quad sound speakers on the bottom, our user interface in the middle. So that's kind of your, your front overview. If we flip it to the back, you get to see the flex tilt adjustment on top. We have a rear facing microphone uh, with echo noise cancellation and a rear facing LED as well, uh, right by that microphone that kind of shines against the wall, which is nice. Um, and then we have our, uh, our, our wall plate here, um, which we call single, double, or triple gang box mounting. So it can kind of mount to um, all three here. Here's a, a double, and you can see if I had a triple, it would line up with the triple gang box. So real flexible mounting from that uh, perspective. We have the locking screw on the bottom with this retention spring. That way you don't lose the screw. It's not gonna fall out on the floor. It's actually spring loaded and it's got a capture mechanism there to keep that that way. We've got the smart mount terminal block um, and we've got what we call the breakaway wall tamper and that's for commercial installations uh, that requires that. If we look inside, this should look pretty familiar to one of our other um, uh, our other slides here. You get the legacy radio, the daughter card, the power G daughter card, the expansion slot. Uh, you got the lithium ion battery right here. We significantly changed the battery actually from IQ panel two to IQ panel four. This is a new, what we call 18650 cell. And uh, it's much easier to replace. The, if, you, if you ever replaced a battery in a gen two panel, it used like a command strip. You had to pull out the command strip and the tape and take the battery out and then peel it off and stick a new battery in. This actually just snaps into a little holder um, and it's uh, much easier to, uh, to change the battery. We've got the barrel jack there on the bottom, the smart mount connection with the blade connectors, and then what we call the IQ base connection. And that IQ base connection, if you can see my, my camera here, let me take this off. That IQ base connection actually uses this cord on the IQ base to plug into the panel. And one of the cool things is, is when you power the IQ base on the body on the bottom of the base, it actually powers the entire panel through that cable. So we're transmitting power and speaker through us through that single cable here, um, and just makes for a really clean installation if you're using IQ base. You don't have to have multiple transformers or multiple cords. Um, now, one of the things I want to mention on this slide, you'll again, this is right from the installation manual. You'll see the big red note on the bottom of the of the uh, uh, screen here. And uh, again, this is very similar to Gen 2. We always say that the panel should never be uh, uh, you know, powered down incorrectly. And what you have to remember is that this is essentially a computer, right? And um, so you treat that a little bit differently than you might treat uh, a different security panel. Traditionally, when I go train a lot of technicians, I ask them, what's the number one, um, you know, if something's going wrong on the panel, what's the first thing you do? And they all say power cycle, right? If something's not working, and this goes for any, you know, whether it's your computer or your phone or anything, it doesn't matter what piece of technology it is, kind of troubleshooting 101 is let's just power cycle it, let it boot back up and see if it, um, see if it recovers. Um, and on a traditional security panel, they would do that by just unplugging the transformer and unplugging the battery. There is no power down button, there is no software. Um, on IQ panel four, we're running software. And so we want to make sure that you power that down gracefully if you can. You just do that from settings. There's an actual power down button. If you just want to reboot it, you can do that. We have an actual panel reboot button. And if for some reason, if the panel was really stuck where you couldn't get into the software to do either the power down or the power reset, we do have a hard reset as well. And you can press and hold the button on the side of the panel for 30 seconds. Should really only do, shouldn't really ever have to do that, but it is there just in case uh, you need it, just so you know. When it comes to wiring up the panel, we have two different ways to wire it. Again, we have the barrel jack connection and we have the terminal block on the smart mount backplate. 
The panel comes with a seven volt DC power supply. And we say in the manual that you should go no further than about a hundred feet on that before voltage drop will be a problem. The actual headroom is more than that, but um, when we do all of our UL testing, we get to about 100 feet. Um, you can go as small as 22 gauge wire, but <clears throat> we're going to recommend that you stay at 18 gauge wire for your power wire. That'll get you the furthest uh, distance away from your transformer without having a voltage drop problem. And then lastly, in the hardware, uh, you've got that top screw for the flex mount. And again, you can just uh, twist it and actually. Uh, aim the camera up or down, depending on what you're trying to look at, whether it's on a table stand or on a wall, gives you that flexibility to, uh, to change that camera angle. Okay, so that's kind of it on the hardware overview. I want to give you a quick overview on some of the software elements here, and then we'll dive into programming. So on the home screen, we have three main elements. Uh, the top element is called the header and the settings tray. We've got the primary user interface in the middle, and we've got the page indication uh, on the bottom here. Inside the header, we have four, uh, kind of, or inside the message center, we have four distinct features. We have a contact us. You can have all of your information populated there. So it'll, it'll show your security company name and email address and phone number. You've got video tutorials, so customers can watch videos on how to use the panel. You've got alerts and alarms as well as messages. And you can actually push messages down to the panel through what's called the alarm.com enterprise messages uh, feature on the back end. So you can push down things like your bill is due or uh, you know, all kinds of different messages uh, directly to the panel, which is kind of nice. You've got the settings tray. This is kind of one of the defining features of the panel here. To get to this, you just swipe down from the top and this gives you access to settings and photo frame and uh, the language toggle right here in the middle that I was talking about, as well as brightness and display. You can even touch these icons up here on the upper uh, right, and they'll give you a status. So if I was to touch this battery icon, it would read me out a status of the percentage of charged. Let me know that it's charging. That's a great way to check you have power to the panel, that you don't have anything wrong uh, with your transformer or with any of your wiring. Go make sure that the battery is charging or charged all the way up right there, and that will help you see that. Inside the settings, uh, if you just if you press this actual settings uh, button here, it lands you at kind of an initial settings page. And this initial settings page gives you access to anything that doesn't necessarily require a master code, a dealer code, or an installer code. So uh, things like the display, <clears throat> the brightness, the weather temperature, you can see some status of your devices, um, all kinds of different things like that. Where most of the programming is done is in what we call advanced settings. And so in order to get into advanced settings, you're going to have two different codes. Um, and the first code is what we call the installer code. The default for that is 1111. And the second is the dealer code. And the default for that is 2222. Now, a lot of people will ask, what's the difference between the installer code and the dealer code? The answer is not very much, but the dealer code actually has the highest level of access. So that's going to give you the ac access to every single setting. The biggest difference is what we call dealer branding. So the ability to kind of customize and brand the panel with your logo, with your custom help videos, um, with custom photo frame screensaver images. So dealer branding is one big difference. And probably the next biggest difference is the ability to master reset the panel. So if for whatever reason you had to factory default it, you would need the dealer code in order to be able to do that. Those are kind of the two main differences there. All right, <clears throat> and with that, uh, any questions before we kind of get started with uh, diving into the programming here? Neil or Joel or Mark, any any questions from that last couple sections here? Uh, uh, we're doing. I just did want to reiterate really quick. Uh, we're getting a lot of questions of uh, where to find these videos, or even this one afterwards. Um, it's it's going to, all of these videos are posted on the Qualsys YouTube page. There is a link to the YouTube page in the chat. So you guys can find them all there. Perfect. Thank you, Joel. Appreciate that. Okay, guys, let's dive in. This is kind of my favorite portion of the training. Um, uh, if if you were in one of our in-person classes, you would all have a a panel in front of you and we would go through this together. Um, I suspect that most of you do not have a panel in front of you at this time. Uh, if you do, 
go ahead and pull it out. You can follow along. Uh, but if not, uh, you know, we'll just walk you through it here on the screen. Uh, one of the things I want to call out is that every panel comes with a single sheet of paper inside. And I know nobody reads um, and that you just crumple it up and, and throw it away. Um, but this is a, a pretty nice uh, quick guide here to kind of walk you through the first few steps. So that is in the box uh, if you want to go through it. Um, and we're going to use that kind of as our step-by-step -step guide here today to walk you through it. So step one is wall mount. And uh, in order to wall mount this, you're going to take the back plate off of the panel here. And I've, I've got mine here in front of me. So you just take this, make sure this is unscrewed here, your retention screw. Take your back plate off the panel, and you're going to go ahead and mount it to the wall. Now, we've got some considerations for that, which I want to talk about a little bit. Uh, right in the quick guide here, it says use number six flathead screws. Uh, we want to make sure that the screw head doesn't protrude uh, beyond this back plate so much that it actually holds the panel off the back plate, causing a panel tamper or a problem with the power connection. So using the right screws is critical. Um, now we do have some changes coming. This is a new back plate here that Neil was referencing earlier. So again, <clears throat> some of our early adopters have said, have said, hey, the back plate that you guys launched with, um, you know, that's great. I can use these small screws, but it's still kind of susceptible to warping on the wall. Um, it's a little bit hard to get this bottom center screw set and a lot of other really good feedback we've had from you. So we've done a lot of design changes here to the back plate. We've added some ribs to stiffen this up. Um, we've added a couple of little hooks here on the side. So this back plate will actually now snap into place and hold tightly on the back of the panel. We've added a center screw here on the, on the back plate now. So you can mount it directly centered over a single gang box if you want to do that. Um, so that's really, really nice. Um, and we've changed this, uh, this area over here a little bit by the tamper. Um, so this now fits much larger screws. So if you get one of the new back plates, it's a little bit less critical on which screws you use. If you've got the current back plate that we're shipping with right now, it's really important that you use flat head screws, like a drywall screw or something like that. If you use a pan head screw, it's going to keep the panel off the wall a little bit more than it should, and you might have a problem. Now, this new back plate, you're probably asking when's it coming. Um, it's coming here early in this next year. So this is a change that we'll just cut in. Uh, very early on here, and one day you start, you'll start buying panels and they'll have this new back plate. Um, you latch it on the top here like we saw in the video, so it just latches on these big hooks here like that, and you swing it down into place, and then set your screw, and you're off and running. Now, again, I've got a quick video on that. I want to show this to you. It is in the YouTube uh, videos we link to. You can watch this in a better format. Uh, later, but I want to show you a couple things here as well just to hit this home. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right. So again, I know that came through very choppy, guys. We have these videos on our YouTube page. You can watch them later. But hopefully you're able to capture the couple key takeaways there. Again, heavy focus on using the right screws here, especially with the current version of the back plate, <clears throat> making sure you're using a flathead screw, that it's not over tightened. You saw in the video that we backed that one screw off that lower left corner where the tamper post and the power blade connectors are a little bit. You don't want that to be warped if you're on not a very flat wall so you can back that particular screw off a little bit and then um uh the last tip i'll give you is that retention screw that's up underneath the panel here on the bottom can be a little bit hard to get to depending on your screwdriver so make sure you have a, a good kind of long shaft screwdriver to access that screw it'll make your life a lot easier if you're trying to use you know the back end of a a stubby screwdriver or something like that. This can be pretty hard. <clears throat> um, and if you have a, a longer screwdriver that's Phillips, getting up in here is a lot easier to do. So those are kind of my tips and tricks for mounting the panel. It should be significantly easier than the Gen 2 panel. We've made a lot of improvements. We're still listening to you even on the current version and we have some new improvements coming uh, to the new version here soon. But really important that you get that on the wall in the right way. Table stand is, is very similar and simple. Again, take the back plate off, snap the table stand in. Just make sure you route the cord through this little opening here in the bottom so you don't pinch the power cord and then use your set screw. We've got a video on this, but we're not gonna watch it. You guys can watch it later if you want. And then IQ base, same thing here. Take off the wall bracket, snap the IQ base into place. Make sure you use your, your black connector here and then power the IQ base and you're good to go. And again, we've got a video here, but in the interest of time, I'm, I'm not gonna watch that as well. That video is also posted on our YouTube page. Now, once you've got it mounted, whether it's table stand, base, or wall, you're gonna go ahead and power it up. Make sure your positive and negative are correct, and then press and hold the side button for three seconds to go ahead and, and power it up. By now, you're gonna wanna make sure your alarm.com account is created. You don't have to do it right now. You could have done it ahead of time, but if you haven't done it by this point, now is a good time to make sure your alarm.com account is created. And the reason is, is as we go through step five, the easy install wizard, the panel is going to automatically want to run a bunch of tests. It's going to try activate the cell radio and the dual path, and it's going to try talk to alarm.com and download your programming templates and do a whole bunch of smart stuff. And if you don't have your alarm.com account created, some of that stuff will fail. Now you can still skip past those if you want, if you just want to get going. You can always activate it later, but just know that a lot of the screens are reliant on your connection to alarm.com. So best to create your account ahead of time if you hadn't already. Um, I've got a couple quick screenshots here we'll walk through. Um, I also have a video as well. Again, we won't watch the video, but we'll go through some of the screenshots. You know, when you first power up the panel, it's going to land you with this landing page. And this is designed to be what we call the easy install wizard, right? So it's what I call installation manual built in. I feel like just about anybody should be able to pick up this panel with virtually no training, kind of work their way through the install wizard. And by the time they come out the other side, uh, they should have their installation done. Uh, but the first thing we ask you is your language. So you'll set that. And the very next thing we ask is for you to connect to Wi-Fi. Now, why do we want you to connect to Wi-Fi first? Uh, remember, we depend on Wi-Fi for a couple different things. One is our dual path connection to alarm.com. So we kind of increase that speed uh, and that, that redundancy to the, to the back end through signaling. And the second is software updates. Uh, we do all of our software updates over Wi-Fi. And so we wanna make sure that we have that connected uh, kind of first and foremost. That's the very first screen you're gonna see after selecting your language. It's very simple. You scan, it'll scan for networks it can see. You type in the password, you hit connect, and it is going to 
connect. Then you'll hit next. And the panel actually goes through an automated system check. So the first page is gonna do all this automatically. There's nothing you have to do. Again, it's gonna go check that dual path connection and that Wi-Fi connection to the alarm.com backend. So it'll test that successfully. Then it's gonna go check for AC power. <clears throat> this is really nice and let you know if your AC power is actually up and running. It's gonna go ahead and check the battery to make sure it's connected and charging. It's then gonna start checking any of the radios that are installed on the system. So it's first gonna check for the PowerG daughter card and make sure that it's, in, that it's installed correctly. And again, this should come this way out of the box from the factory. It's nothing you have to do here, but it is gonna run a check for you to let you know that's working. It'll go check any of the other daughter cards as well, the S-Line, et cetera. <clears throat> and then it's gonna go activate the actual SIM card or the radio uh, on alarm.com. After that, it's gonna go ahead and do a download um, and it will uh, download any of your templates. So some of you have programming templates on alarm.com to kind of auto program the panel. It'll do that automatically. And then when you hit next, it's gonna take you right to the ready to add sensor menu. So uh, here you are ready to add your sensors. You just hit start on the panel. It'll say searching for sensors and you're gonna go ahead and trigger your sensor uh, and depending on the sensor, that may vary. If it's a legacy sensor, you can just open, close it, you can tamper it, things like that. If it's a power G sensor, you're gonna to need to do the, um, either hold the enroll button for three seconds, insert the batteries, whatever that particular power G device needs in order for it to transmit its learning code to the panel. And each power G device is a little bit different depending on which device it is. Uh, once you transmit the code, the panel automatically picks it up it pre-configures it for you based on what it thinks it is, but it allows you to automatically or to, to manually change uh, these different uh, sensor types, sensor groups, names, chimes, all kinds of things like that. And then you'd hit save. It'll show you the list as you go. So you can just add new device over and over and over. It'll keep track of that as you go. You can go back and edit the sensor name if you'd like as part of this process. And then once you're done adding all your sensors, you can do a very simple sensor test directly from this screen. <clears throat> now we have the advanced sensor test, which I showed you earlier. You can run after the fact, but as part of the actual install wizard, we let you kind of run a simplified test as well, more like a pass fail, it's strong, good, poor. So you can kind of gauge uh, right from the start how well these are working at the install location. Next, we allow you to enable the panel glass break. Maybe the panels uh, in an area where uh, you want to uh, to use that. Maybe it's by the front door, there's a transom window, maybe it's in the kitchen next to a bunch of glass. Um, so just depending on where the panel is, you can quickly enable the panel glass break with a single touch. You can also add Z-Wave devices directly from the install wizard. So when you're adding a Z-Wave device, one of the things we recommend is that you clear the device before you add it. So we always say clear it, and it gives you the option to do that. And then it will clear it. And then you can actually add the device just by pressing include or add device and then pressing the button on the device itself. If it's an S2 device, it'll, add, it'll automatically prompt uh, for S2 authentication. It'll, it'll go get all the required information automatically. And then you can give it a, an actual uh, name uh, if you want. You can customize that name. Like living room light, for example. Um, the other thing you can do here is to continue to add devices. So very similar to uh, your door window sensors. Uh, if you have more devices to add, you can clear and add, clear, add, clear, add, clear, add, kind of all the way until you're done with all your Z-Wave devices. So very convenient to, the, to do that all from a single place. And then when you continue on, it's gonna ask you to optimize the network. And all you do is hit start. And it's gonna go out and remap the entire Z-Wave network and uh, do what we call a rediscovery of the network. So here it is, optimizing network. And after that, you can pair Bluetooth devices. So you can see the easy install wizard is kind of walking you through, setting up the panel, setting up sensors, setting up Z-Wave. If you didn't have specific things, you could always use the skip or the next button in the lower right-hand corner. In this case, we'll show you what Bluetooth pairing looks like. So if I was to hit pair, it's gonna go ahead and search for a phone, make sure your phone is in Bluetooth pairing mode. 
it'll find a device. In this example, this is my phone here. I touch on it. It says pairing in progress. It pops up a code. This should be very familiar to anybody who's done any Bluetooth. It'll pop up a code on the phone. You make sure they match. You press pair on the panel, pair on the phone, and then it will actually pair. Again, you can pair a second device or a third device. You can pair an IQ remote directly from here if you want, a secondary keypad. All you gotta do is make sure they're on the same network. You can add users. You can edit your contact information. Again, this information should be pre-populated here automatically from alarm.com. Um, if that's not the case, you, or if something's wrong, you can give it a chance to come in and edit the contact information. And then you, lastly, you can check for an update to make sure that your software is up to date, which in this case it was. This was 400 at the time. Lastly, this is kind of a cool screen. You can ask your customer to scan one of these apps, whether they're, whether they're iOS or Google Play. They can actually scan it and start to get the app on their phone. I always like to do that so that they're kind of working on their side while I'm working on my side. Um, and uh, this links directly to uh, the alarm.com app. Uh, for them to do that easily. You can choose to watch an overview video before you finish if you want, or you can just hit exit. And I, we won't watch that video, but that's it for the easy install wizard. So that was kind of fast, I know, guys. And again, normally we'd kind of do that um, in an in-person class. We'd do it together with an actual panel. Um, but I wanted you to at least see the in easy install wizard if you hadn't seen that before. Mark, Joel, Neil, any any questions from the crowd on the easy install wizard or other items before we move on? Um, Kevin, really the biggest question that I've that I've gotten over the last couple minutes is uh, when upgrading from an IQ2 to an IQ4 um, and what that process looks like in, in alarm.com. Yeah, so that's something that's being worked on is is where we're at with that today. Um, Today, you know, uh, many of you have probably done a backup of an IQ Panel 2, installed a new IQ Panel 2, and done a restore, and all the devices and, and sensors were pushed down uh, to the panel for the most part. Um, we're working on mapping that from IQ Panel 2 to IQ Panel 4 right now. So we're working very closely with alarm.com on that. That's not done today, so you can't back up a, an IQ Panel 2 and push it to an IQ Panel 4 yet. Um, you can do a module swap, so you can still swap the module keep their logins, keep their cameras, keep everything the same. Um, but from the device side, you would need to reprogram the sensors and the Z-Wave uh, on the new IQ Panel 4 for now. But we expect that to change here in the near future. Hey, Kevin. Oh, uh, oh. Go right ahead. Sorry about that. There have been some additional questions uh, around IQ Hub that was mentioned. Uh, what are the major differences and rather than answering all those independently on this chat maybe you could just give that rundown live for us please yeah sure so some of you guys may have heard of iq hub we have not quite yet released it for most people uh, we're kind of in a limited release situation right now with supply chain on iq hub so iq panel 4 is released for everybody iq hub was really designed to be a cost down version of iq panel 2. Um, it's uh, a little bit uh, more cost effective. It's designed to be cheaper, quite frankly. Um, and for that, you do lose some features between IQ Panel 2 or IQ Panel 4, because those are pretty similar in features, um, versus IQ Hub. So the, the biggest one, uh, there's a couple big ones. There's no panel camera on IQ Hub. So we removed the camera to save some cost and to get that, that cost down. Not everybody wants a panel camera, especially smart apartments or some of these more entry level um, um, marketplaces or verticals. Um, so that goes away on IQ Hub. Um, there's no two-way voice on IQ Hub. And probably the biggest difference is that there's only a single security radio on IQ Hub. Um, there's no panel glass break either, but um, I think the, the security radio is the biggest one. So rather than having that dual F we talked about, it only has one. So you'd either buy, it'd be Power G only. That's all you get is Power G or 319 only, or 345 only, or 433 only. So quite frankly, almost every security system on the market today only does one, and that's kind of in line with that. For us, that's uh, that's a departure from our dual SRF where we've been on IQ Panel 2 and IQ Panel 4, and that's a pretty significant difference for us. 
but if you're used to only having one security radio and standardizing on a single uh, flavor of devices, then that may be okay for you. And that's that's kind of what IQ Hub is designed for. It's designed to hit kind of very specific targeted marketplaces um, where um, every penny counts and um, you're okay with some of those restrictions. So just for those that are interested in IQ Hub, work with um, your uh, salesman on our side um, to uh, to engage with them as, as quantities are limited and we're kind of rolling that out in a very targeted fashion um, for some of these specific verticals and specific customers. Um, so again, if that's something you're interested in, we can get you enrolled in that program, but we need to know ahead of time as uh, as supply chain quantities are, are kind of limited on that product right now, so. Hey, Kevin. Um, yep. A lot of questions on uh, future firmware releases, and in, in particular 4.1. Do we have an ETA on that? And also, uh, I've seen a few people ask about Control 4 integration. Yeah, so I can answer both those right now. So 4.1 is coming here the first quarter of 2022. Let's call it February for now. Could be could get pulled into January, could get pushed to March, but let's let's target February right there in the middle. So starting you know early 2022, we should have 4.1 done. Um, and as it relates to Control 4, Control 4 is supported on IQ Panel 2 today. Uh, as, as many of you know, it's not yet supported on IQ Panel 4. So if you're using the Control 4 integration, you'll want to stay on IQ Panel 2 for another month or two here until it comes in IQ Panel 4 as part of 4.1. Um, but that's probably the only real difference I can think of between uh, where IQ Panel 2 has something that IQ Panel 4 doesn't. In general, IQ Panel 4 has everything from IQ Panel 2 plus all these new features we've talked about. I think Control 4 is about the only thing I can think of where that doesn't hold true yet, but but it will soon. And you know, that's something we did, uh, not to go off on too much of a tangent, but that's something we focused very heavily on with IQ Panel 4. Oftentimes you'll see a manufacturer introduce a new platform and then kind of deprecate the old platform or say, oh, it doesn't work with all that old stuff. Uh, you know, we're looking at new stuff in the future, but it doesn't work with anything you've been doing. And on IQ Panel 4, it works with virtually everything uh, that's that's been on IQ Panel 2, um, all the devices and and all that kind of stuff. So um, we worked really hard on that backwards compatibility as much as we did on the forwards compatibility uh, with the new hardware and software updates you'll see over time. All right, I know that we are coming up on time here. My clock says I have 13 minutes left. I think I'll be perfect. I'm going to go pretty fast through a couple additional key points here. And I want to make sure we get you out the door on time here, as I know this has been long already today. <clears throat> My voice is kind of filling it. You guys have been sitting there a long time. Our attendance is shockingly high. I really appreciate everybody staying, staying with me here the entire time. This has been great, and hopefully you're learning a lot. Um, a couple other things I want to cover, and again, I'm just going to kind of cherry pick a few things here. Uh, for Bluetooth disarm, um, this pairs the exact same way the Gen 2 panel does. One of the key settings for Bluetooth disarm is what we call this Bluetooth disarm timeout, and the default for this is 10 minutes. Think of this like an extended exit delay for Bluetooth. So after you arm the panel and leave, 10 minutes has to pass before the phone can come back into the Bluetooth range in order to disarm. That gives you time. Maybe you're in the driveway buckling the kids in the car seats or in the garage or something like that, and you don't want the system to automatically disarm while you're while you're still in the vicinity. Um, this kind of gives you some extra, extra exit delay or extra buffer while still having the system armed. The Bluetooth portion isn't activated until this timeout occurs. You can change it, but the default is 10 minutes. So just know that. Um, pairing, we already talked about, it's pretty easy to do. The one thing I want to talk about is the Bluetooth audio streaming, because this is brand new for IQ Panel 4. So traditionally, for Bluetooth disarming, we would do what we call a one-way pairing, where when you paired your phone to the panel, the panel could see your phone, but your phone wouldn't really see the panel. And so over here on the left, it would show not connected on the phone, and that was normal. Um, it would say connected on the panel, the phone would say not connected. It's kind of what we call a passive connection. And we would just kind of use it in the background and um, allow that for, for Bluetooth disarming. In order to do Bluetooth audio streaming, we need to do what's called an active connection. And so in order to do that, all you do on your phone is surf to your Bluetooth page, go find the IQ panel, 
um, uh, Bluetooth disarm, BTD. So IQ panel Bluetooth disarm icon. And instead of it saying not connected, just touch it. It'll go from a little spinny wheel connecting and then it will say connected. And once you have an active connection, and this should be really no different than your car or any of your Bluetooth speakers, um, anything like that. Once it's actively connected, the sounds on your phone are gonna play out of your panel. So if you're gonna go stream music and things like that directly off your phone, it'll play from your panel through this active Bluetooth connection. So that's a tip and trick to get the audio or Bluetooth music streaming working. Panel glass break, I won't spend a lot of time on here. We talked about it a little bit already. Just know that uh, it's about 15 feet from the panel is the range. We're using all three microphones now for that instead of just the two. Um, we have a glass break test file. Probably one of the biggest questions we get on the panel glass break is how do I test it? It's easy to enable, but now I need to test it and send a signal to the central station. So in order to do that, you wanna to go to our dealer site and download the test file onto your smartphone. We actually play a, uh, a file that the panel recognizes as the sound of breaking glass. And we can actually trip the panel glass break detector from the sensor test page, panel glass break test. Uh, you can actually trip it um, uh, right here on this page. There's two ways to do it. You can do kind of just a local test uh, by hitting run. And if you clap, the circle will turn yellow. If you play the file, the circle will turn green. Or if you actually wanna send a signal to the central station, you would press this start button right here. And then it's gonna go ahead and pop up a little dialog box. You press okay, you arm the system, and then you play the file. That will actually trip the panel, put it into alarm, send a signal to the central station, and you're kind of off and running from a testing perspective. So that's really helpful from, from that. Um, panel motion detector, I won't spend a ton of time on, but the panel camera can be a detector as well. Now this is not a traditional PIR. This is not gonna dispatch the police. This is used for rules. So like, for example, when I walk past the panel and I want it to take a picture, you would need the panel motion detector to be on in order for that to work. Or maybe you, maybe you want it when you walk past the panel to write a rule to turn on a light after dark that the panel motion detector would need to be on in order to do that. So you just do that from the installer settings menu, turn on the panel motion, it automatically takes you over to zone programming, everything's preset for you, hit save and you're off and running. Couple, couple best practices on IQ Remote, again, we're winding down on time, so I'm gonna go fast, but on IQ Remote, one of the biggest things, of course, IQ Remote's a Wi-Fi device, and so controlling the Wi-Fi or making sure you have good Wi-Fi or the Wi-Fi settings are correct, is probably the key to success for IQ Remote. I think the best thing you can do, the best thing you can do is install your own network, uh, like IQ Wi-Fi or IQ Wi-Fi 6. That's the very best thing you can do to control the network. Beyond that, you can configure an existing network to work better with IQ Remote. And we recommend connecting to a dedicated 2.4 and 5, 2.4 gigahertz network. So try not to connect to networks that are combined that do what we call band steering, where the network is actually putting some devices on 2.4, some on 5, and trying to kind of move everything around. Uh, IQ remotes don't tend to do well there. So we suggest you split the network into two networks, connect the panel and connect the IQ remote to the same 2.4 gigahertz network. That's going to be your, uh, your best uh, bet at having a secure connection on Wi-Fi for an IQ remote. There's a way to test it. Um, and it pairs to the panel just through the, the pairing menu, pretty easy to do. Now, a couple other key programming fields I wanna call out here real quick. These are like tips and tricks for pro installers to know. Uh, many of you have probably noticed that in order to learn in a legacy RF sensor, all you have to do is open and close it. And that makes it really convenient to learn in sensors. Sometimes, however, you might be on a big job and you might have a lot of sensors already installed and people are coming and going and walking all around and sending lots of signals and tripping stuff when you don't want them to. We have a nice setting on the panel where you can go turn off. It's under installer settings. It's called open close reports allowed for auto learn. If you turn this off, you actually have to tamper the sensor before it will enroll. And so if you're in a high traffic installation environment, maybe you're in a commercial environment or a very busy home with existing sensors, my tip to you is you can go turn this off and then only tampers will register at the panel for learning, uh, making a much more purposeful action 
as you're kind of walking around and learning things in. So up to you if, if you want to do that or not. One other trick is this installer test mode. So maybe it's late at night, maybe the baby's sleeping, maybe for whatever reason you want to do a whole bunch of uh, send all your signals to the central station and you want to test this without having the loud siren uh, blaring. You can go into panel programming, you can put the panel into installer test mode, it'll disable all the sirens for 30 minutes and then it will automatically revert itself to sirens on 30 minutes later so you don't have to remember to go turn this setting back on. So that's installer test mode. A couple other things that are kind of common, there's two of them. One is auto stay, so by default this is turned on. And what this means, if the panel is armed away and then they don't actually leave, they don't trigger an exit delay door, um, then the panel is going to automatically downgrade to stay. And that's designed to reduce false alarms. Every once in a while we have people say, hey, I want to arm to away, but then I'm going to stay for whatever reason. Um, in that case, if they want to do that, you'd want to turn this option off. Same with arm stay, no delay. Sometimes people want to do the opposite. They want to arm stay, but then they want to leave. And in that case, they're going to exit delay. You could go turn this option off. So those are both on by default, but depending on how your customer uses the system, either coming or going, you might want to change one of those two options or both. User management, we support 242 user codes. So a lot of codes. They can be classified as dealer, installer, master, user, guest, or duress. Uh, and the about page on the panel, I just is something I like technicians to know about. Uh, you can get a lot of information from here about your battery and cellular and Z-Wave, hardware, software version, all kinds of different information can be found here. Wi-Fi, what you're connected to, things like that. So go to this page, play around, look at the different information there. I pretty much go here on every single install just to at least go check the software, see what version it's on, make sure my Wi-Fi is available, things like that. Testing and tools. We have a lot of different tests on the panel. I want to highlight a couple. Uh, the Wi-Fi test will test the connection to the router. It does not test the connection outside the home, does not test the internet. If you want to do that, go back to the about page here and look at your Wi-Fi information, make sure it says internet available. Um, the sensor test, again, we talked about this earlier, but this is a really powerful test. The first thing I'll ask, anytime somebody asks me, hey, I have a sensor problem, what do you suggest? My number one answer will say, what does the sensor test say? What does the sensor test show you? Nine times out of 10, they never looked at it, they don't know. And uh, this is just a really great tool once you know how to use it. Uh, you can actually check the noise floor inside that home so you can get the how much noise is in the environment on that frequency and you can actually plot the sensors on a graph now we draw a red line and a yellow line on the graph those are your caution lines what we do is we take this noise floor this average noise floor and then we go up six decibels and we draw a red line we go another six db and we draw a yellow line and um this really gives you your caution line. So if you're above the yellow line and in the green, you're good to go. I like to say if you have a sensor dropping down here in the yellow, you might, you probably want to consider changing something. Move the sensor, add a repeater, go power G, change the sensor's orientation, something like that. See if it got better, see if it got worse. And you can actually test that. So you can kind of do some trial and error. And if you're in the red, then you need to change something. It's likely going to have a problem. We're still picking up the signal. We're still plotting it and showing it right now, but it might not in the future if there's any kind of environmental change down the road. If people are moving furniture, doing all kinds of different things that can change the way the signals reflect. And so uh, that gives you a really great tool on board there. We have a, a great video about that on our uh, YouTube page, but we're not going to watch it. On Power G, we have a very unique Power G test. You can run the test uh, directly from the panel. You can actually ping the sensor and you get a result, strong, good, or poor. They're color-coded. It's also the same result that you can get directly on the sensor itself via the PowerG LED or the placement test. And again, we have a great video on this, but we won't watch it today. You can watch it uh, off our YouTube page. We also have a whole bunch of Z-Wave, and we won't spend time on Z-Wave today, but we have a whole Z-Wave networking class where we talk about mesh networks and how they work. Um, and we have a lot of different Z-Wave tools built into the panel. And again, the goal here is to <clears throat> teach you how to design a Z-Wave system, give you the tools to make sure you know that system is functioning well before you leave the home, 
so you don't have to go back. And one of those tools is Rediscover Network. The other tool is Neighbor Info. You can see how much overlap is in the network and which nodes can see which other nodes. The more neighbors something has, the better. That, that's possible routes that it can typically go to, to to jump back to the main panel. We have counters where we're keeping track of all the acknowledged versus failed commands in the background, and you're shooting for a 98% efficient network. So this tells you how the network's performing over time. And of course, the graphical interface of what we call the last working route. And so we show the actual route that the device took to get back to the panel, and we do that right on the screen. So I highly encourage you to use uh, these tools that are provided for you on the panel, not to just hope it works, cross your fingers and have to go back later. A few minutes spent on each install up front will save you a lot of time uh, and troubleshooting on the back end. On the user interface here, and again, I know we're, we're out of time. It's pretty simple to use. I'm gonna go fast here. This all kind of just goes through the, the normal user interface, the emergency buttons, uh, the swiping, the arming, the lights, the locks, the thermostats, the garage door, the camera streaming on the panel, the doorbell um, streaming. I think the biggest thing on the camera and the doorbell streaming is that you need to authorize the cameras in order to be able to do this. That's a privacy setting from alarm.com. So make sure you authorize the cameras and then they'll automatically push to the panel. Same with the doorbell. You need to authorize that that button push or motion push notification to the panel. Um, and then the Manage My System page really allows the customer to stay connected to Wi-Fi, keep their software up to date, and manage their Bluetooth devices. All right, guys, so we are basically done here. I know I had to fly through some of these last slides. I wanna make sure you know about our dealer portal. This is where you can get a lot of different information. You can get videos and LMS. You can go through this training we just did at your own speed and get a certificate that you passed it. You can download marketing docs and technical docs, all kinds of different information on the dealer portal. So if you want access to that, go to dealers.qualsys.com and click on register. We'll get you access to our dealer portal. Also know that we have traditional tech support to help you as well. Uh, you can call the 800 number. We're open Monday through Friday from eight to eight Eastern time. Um, or you can email tech support at qualsys.com and that submits a ticket right to support as well. Um, you can even chat us. Uh, if you go to qualsys.com and click on the question mark in the lower right hand corner or go to the dealer site and do the same you can chat with the tech support agent so lots of different ways that uh, that we can take care of you there and <clears throat> jeremy mentioned these facebook pages i think a lot of you guys are on the facebook pages um, these uh these pages are growing exponentially we have a lot of members more than 5,000 now uh it grows all the time um and uh, highly encourage you to take part in these Facebook groups if you're not already. A lot of good discussion going on there and a lot of good, what we call voice of the customer. And ultimately that's what I wanna end on is, is voice of the customer. Um, what you guys think, what you care about matters a lot to us. It's, it's part of our core, it's part of who we are. It's one of the reasons we do so many software updates um, is we're listening to your feedback. We're always adding new features, we're always improving you always bring us uh, new use cases and new feedback on how we can help you. And so please keep that coming. We're monitoring these Facebook pages. We're engaged, we're on there all the time, answering questions, busting myths, um, and uh, listening, most importantly. So um, please uh, please join those and uh, engage with us uh, through all these, these various ways. And with that, I'm, I'm gonna end. I'm happy to stay on here and take any last minute questions. So Joel, Neil, Mark, pipe up if, if there are any, I'm happy to answer them. We're also, I'm sure, furiously uh, answering your questions over the chat as well. So if you have more, we will keep the line open here. We'll stay on another few minutes before we close the webinar here to answer your questions. Really appreciate everybody's time today, you guys. Um, thanks so much for hanging in there. Again, I can see our attendance is still insanely high here all the way to the end. So I really appreciate everybody's engagement here today. Well, there's been so many questions too, Kevin. I mean, just and and I, I want to thank again, you know, Mark and Neil and and their team for going through and answering all these questions. Literally hundreds and hundreds of questions from all the people that have been joined up today. Hopefully, you got your answers in the chat. If not, again, join those Facebook pages. We'll be able to be there. You know, ask your questions there. You'll get answers from the community. You'll also get answers from us as we join in. 
I do have one more poll question I wanted to ask. I'm very curious, and, I, and we should have asked this earlier. I'm curious to know how often you're using dual SRF, meaning you're using both a leg power G sensor and a legacy sensor on an install. Are you doing it on most of your installs using both types of technology, maybe less than half, or maybe you only use power G or you only use a legacy sensor like a 319.5, 345, or 433. Curious to know which, where, which bucket you fall into because this has been a topic of conversation for us quite a bit. This is a major improvement that we made back in 2016 Oh, sorry, 2018 when we launched IQ Panel 2 Plus, and we think that this is a really powerful feature. And, and the things that we've gotten from the field are generally that yes, most people are using both. And I'm curious to know if that's still still the case with with all the people on the line today. And it looks like uh, as, as those answers come in, that you know more the most of the people are using them on most on on both uh, Power G and Legacy SRF. That's the that's the number one vote so far. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, Again, thanks to all the people that joined in today, Jordan, Freddie, Peter, Mario, Jason, David, Bob, you know, Brown, Ron, yeah, Hundreds Jane, and hundreds of you, yeah. Literally hundreds and hundreds of people today, and I can't thank you enough for joining in and asking all the questions you have. I'll go ahead and close this poll as well. Thanks for, for, uh, for answering that. Neil uh, and team, is there anything else that uh, we want to bring up to Kevin? No, just uh, Kev, a whole lot of good jobs, great jobs, great job. 158 slides in two hours, that's impressive. <laughs> um, just a lot of good good, good comments. Awesome. A nice plug for Neil's uh, technical workshop tomorrow. If, you, if you're not signed up for those technical workshops, we'll put that link in the chat again in case you missed it the first time. Uh, Neil, what's the topic tomorrow? What do they expect? What are they going to come and learn about? Oh, isn't that yeah. a great load? Great deep loaded question. Yeah, deep dive on smart mount tomorrow. Deep dive on smart mount. So that whole mounting process that Kevin talked about and how to do it, um, you know, the different types of mounts, things like that. So it'll be a nice little technical workshop on that. If if you know a technical person, a, an installer or a technician in your organization, even a tech support person that uh, was not on today's training call, share that link with them. I think they'd be very interested to join that quick little uh, quick little session. And again, a reminder that we recorded this session. We will be taking the, the recording and putting it on YouTube later on today uh, once it's cleared out and, and processed, and then you'll be able to access that. And we'll be sending out links so you can watch those again, along with the previous workshops we've done and the previous webinars we've done. And if you know someone that would like to participate in a sales and marketing webinar, next Wednesday we're having one uh, all about the primary feature differentiators of IQ Panel 4, uh, uh, the, the ones that are really going to help you sell it the ones that no one else has. Uh, and we're really gonna focus in on those and how to sell those. And especially for technicians and installers, you know, joining a, a webinar like that will help you as you're trying to upsell a customer in a home. Maybe you're asked to go in and do a 3G upgrade and uh, you were supposed to just swap out the radio, but as you talk about some of these features and benefits, you can convince them to upgrade to an IQ Panel 4 and put a little you know, revenue in your pocket and help the customer get an even better experience. And what, what we found time and time again is on those types of installs, inevitably you also end up adding in a, a light or a lock or a thermostat or something like that as well and there's again some great revenue to be had there as you continue to add more and more devices to that individual customer's portfolio if there's nothing else any other questions or comments from the from the audience that we need to address and i was going to say neil or joel or mark have we got to all the typing ones should we close it out or do we need to stay on a little bit longer here um I think we've got them. Uh, yeah, we've got 99%. Anything that we didn't answer, we'll uh, we'll get on the export and we'll answer it afterwards. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining. We look forward to seeing you again in two weeks, uh, or at least your counterparts if they were not able to join. And we hope that you'll join the Facebook pages and join us on the webinars tomorrow and next week. Thank you very much, and we'll talk to you very soon. Kevin, great work today. Thanks, guys. Have a good one.
Jeremy, Mark. Gentlemen, can we talk internally? We're not broadcasting Only anymore. We want all 64 of our attendees to listen. So what do you got to say? <laughs> well, I just noticed that most of the askers have left. And so we'll have to answer those questions at a later time. Feel free to yeah, we'll, send over we'll a copy. Reports and we'll share that out with people um, uh, internally, and then we can get back to those individuals. Um, Perfect. Thank you, a, sir. On a basis. Yep. So the rest of you 55 people listening in, thanks for joining. And uh, I think Mark Buck Buckley should send you a hat. <laughs> Very good point, but mm -hmm. I don't have or a maybe list I should send 55. you a hat. If you're still listening, you should email jeremiah.mclaren at jci.com with your address and tell them that you were still on and you, you deserve a hat. Boom. Send it to me. Maybe I will. <laughs> Thanks, Great. everyone. We'll see you later. Thank you.